Good evening. We're on the air again with another edition of Patients on the News. I, uh, I sometimes say we've been doing this 16 years. I think it might even be 17 years. Every month except for the two summer months, uh, year after year. And we have a guest tonight. David Packham is his name. We're going to talk briefly at the beginning about him and his day job and what he is doing in this state uh, in a nonprofit way. And uh, I want to tell you, I, David got in touch with me. We talked on the phone oh, about a month ago. I didn't know what he was involved in. He described it. He's provided me with information on it. I've looked into it. And I would say in the 16 or 17 years that we've been doing this show, we've done some really good ones. We've had some people on who really were interesting and uh, mostly about politics and government and public affairs. This program, this interview is, in my judgment, the most important one we have ever done, the most important, and it's about addiction. And I've learned things that shock me. I really do have, have, have been shocked. So, David, thank you for getting in touch with me. Uh, I am absolutely delighted that you are bringing your important message to our audience. Well, thank so, you for having me this evening. Delighted to be here. And this is a message about addiction, about alcohol, drugs, and kids and all the people that are watching this show, every last one of them have children, parents, relatives, grandchildren who are affected by the message that you have. And so I am absolutely grateful to you for coming on this show and I think people watching this show will be grateful to you. First, before we get into what you're doing and your message, uh, I have known you a long time. I know your grandfather, when I was going to high school in Cape Elizabeth, <laughs> your grandfather had a drugstore uh, right up the street from the high school. A lot of kids I knew worked yep. at your Nelson. grandfather. Nelson Packham. Nelson Packham. So this is, I should say, David Packham, Nelson's grandson. Yeah, that's right. And David, you grew up in Scarborough. Grew up in Scarborough, right. We battled against you Cape boys all the time. And then you, uh, you went to the University of Maine. Yes. And then you went to graduate school at BC. Correct. And got a master's in finance. Yes. Got a master's in finance. And then what did you do? Well, I, I, uh, I, I came back to Maine. I uh, got a job at Bath Iron Works. And ultimately, you became director of finance at Bath Ironworks. Director of finance, and, and my last job was vice president of contracts. Vice president of contracts, which is the business yes. contracts. Yes, yes, yeah. Billions of dollars worth of contracts. Right, right, yeah. So you, de you dealt with the Navy and yeah. uh, on contracts and disputes and yes. things of that sort? Yes, and we had lots of disputes. You had lots of disputes. <laughs> well, and billions of dollars of yes, disputes. Indeed. Yes, indeed. And then... You left there, and what did you do? Uh, I ran a telecommunications company uh, in Standish, Maine, and, uh, and combined it with some other companies. I uh, worked for the owner. I, I did that for a few years. Then I, I started with... Was that Standish? Began as Standish Telephone. You, it was called, you, yep, it was called Utilities Incorporated. Yeah. And then... Uh, a but then they went into cable and all kinds of things. We did. Uh, and then I broke off and started a, uh, another... Uh, a software development company that did back office um, billing and other services for telecommunications companies. And I, I ran that with my two partners for about 10 years. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and then what are you doing now? Uh, today, I'm uh, the chief executive officer of Pineland Farms Natural Meats. And so you, you have cattle out there at Pineland. We do have some cattle there, but we, we have, uh, we've got cattle all over the eastern seaboard, as far west as Ohio, as far south as, uh, as uh, Georgia. Really? Yeah. And you, you process meat, you raise cattle, you process meat, and uh, you wholesale it. 
Henry Taylor. Yeah. Henry Taylor. And it's, and it's called Pineland Natural Meat? Yes, Pineland Farms Natural Meats. Yeah. And you run that? Yes. And you told me before we started uh, with the cameras were on, you told me that, for instance, I asked you where you market it. You said, uh, for instance, Whole Foods between Maine and Washington, D.C., all the Whole Foods stores carry your product. Yes, that's right. Yeah, we're the largest uh, natural p supplier in those regions to Whole Foods. Not the only, but the largest. The largest one. Yep. Isn't that something? Yeah. I didn't know that. Good main company. Yes, I didn't know that. Yeah. So you've become, uh, in your spare time, an expert on addiction. Well, you want to tell us how this happened to you? Well, I'll stop short of calling myself an expert. I, I have been doing a lot of study. Yeah. Uh, but uh, several years ago, my wife Karen and I learned that our son was an alcoholic. Uh, he was uh, 32 years old at the time. Uh, he, was the, uh, he was the director of finance at Tufts Medical in Boston. Uh, but he could not stop drinking. And uh, that threw us for a loop. Uh, there was really very little we could do to help him. He had to, he had to go to rehab. He had to he had to find a way out of that difficulty. And what, what we could do was to try to better understand it. Uh, and we studied and we researched and we started to understand how the brain works uh, and how <clears throat> young people are, are especially uh, vulnerable to addiction. So we, when we thought we understood it a little bit better, we thought that, that if, if we could understand it, then other people could understand it. And we developed, uh, we started a, a, uh, an organization called Students Empowered to End Dependency because first and foremost, nothing ever changes with respect to addiction in our communities if, if students are still using at the rate they use because they are the next generation. So it's focused on students. Focused on students. And, it, and students to end uh, dependency. Dependency, which you, the acronym is SEEDS. Correct, okay. SEED, yes. And we decided to have a project, and we decided that we would develop a documentary series where we would interview people who had direct experience with addiction. And we would allow them to tell their stories, and we would ask experts, medical experts and other experts, to comment on what they were experiencing from a, from a strictly a scientific and a medical standpoint. And what we thought might be an hour or 90 minutes is growing into about 12 hours of documentary. Uh, today, we uh, actually tomorrow night at 8 o'clock on Maine Public, episode one will air. It's an hour-long show. And we will air six episodes that are all finished and done. Uh, and then we will run six more episodes. Now, would you say uh, episodes, are they an hour long, a yes. half hour? They're an hour long. They're hour long shows. And featuring kids. Local people. Local people. Local people, mostly young, who have had serious uh, addictions. Uh, the first show is called In the Beginning I Liked It, because one of the things that uh, I remember a high school student telling me uh, was, uh, he said, Mr. Packham, um, the kids won't listen if you try to scare them. Just tell them the truth. And I said, well, what, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, the first show, you've got to say, in the beginning, we liked it. Because everyone has had an experience where they won a state championship, and they went to the bonfire, and they had some beers, and they smoked some pot, and they were with, the, with their friends, and they were bonding. And weeks later, they're still talking about it. And they didn't view that as a dangerous activity. Unfortunately, today, the products that are out there are so much more powerful that the idea of experimentation is gone by the board. We'll, we can talk a little bit about marijuana, but marijuana has become, in my estimation, in my opinion, the most dangerous thing that's happening in the state of Maine today because we have embraced it. We have jumped into the marijuana business with both feet. Is there a difference between the marijuana that existed when you were in high school and the marijuana Very that much. 
It, it's being Very sold. Much. If you if you go back to the 60s, the what's the THC is the psychoactive component, which is shorthand. Uh, THC back in the 60s and 70s, it was one percent uh, concentrated, and oh, up until about the 90s, it only got to about five percent. Um, botanists would cultivate it to make it stronger. People wanted a stronger high associated with marijuana, but it was very, it was pretty weak. In the uh, 2000s, it has grown to about 20 percent concentrated THC in the flower. But what, what the scientists were able to do, chemists, is they were able to isolate the THC molecule and they were able to distill it and concentrate it so that they could put it into oils and gummy bears and cookies and drinks and it could get to more than 90 percent concentrated. So uh, we have in our, one of the groups we're working with is, is an awesome health teacher in Scarborough and we'll be showing her in our episode seven talking to a group of students and she's holding in her hand a vape pen because we've all heard about vaping and how that's, uh, tobacco has made a resurgence because kids can vape it. Well they can also vape marijuana and the concentration in the vape pen that she has in her hand that they just took out of the bathroom in Scarborough High School was 82.7 percent concentrated. That's a dangerous, highly potent drug. It's, it's not unlike, that process is not unlike how cocaine became crack cocaine or crystal meth. It's a process that is designed to make a product very addictive. Uh, and it's quite cynical in my view uh, and why I think it's so, so important that we get this word out because the people who voted for marijuana in the state and that's behind us, I think they thought that they were getting the marijuana from the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. But what the marijuana companies have delivered is a highly potent product that is dangerous. And when I say dangerous, it's not only much more addictive, and we see, we're seeing this in the schools. Uh, you'll, you'll meet someone from USM who is the director of counseling there that, that calls it a tsunami of problems from her, her freshman students coming in who are using too much cannabis. It's been linked to schizophrenia and psychosis. Uh, it's been linked to violence. It's been linked to a number of mental health issues that quite honestly our kids just can't can't take on top of you know staying home for two years from uh, from the pandemic. We have a video, and I think we ought to show the audience sure, now just sure. to put idea. everything in context. And then after the video, we're going we'll to get back, back and ask you uh, some specific questions, which I think uh, people watching this show would ask themselves if they were sitting here. Sure, let's do but that. why don't we begin uh, if we're ready? We're showing this uh, this video that puts all of this in context. In September of 2018, we realized that our son was suffering with alcohol use disorder. And we want to share what we've learned with other folks in hopes that their loved one may be assisted as they pursue recovery. I wanted to understand the science. I wanted to understand what happens emotionally, what happens spiritually. Uh, eventually I met Reggie and we started interviewing many, many people who truly understood addiction. People who had severe addiction. They, they got it and they were in recovery and they told us their stories. I've been a video and film producer in Maine for the last 40 years and nothing has been more important to work on than this TV series. It's really an honor to be part of it and I'm looking forward to the impact and what this series represents to me is the possibility of the happy ending. And the people who have been so courageous, the young people who have shared their stories of resiliency and sharing their personal way out of addiction, I'm hoping that that will have a ripple effect. This documentary series is really what storytelling is about. It's about connecting with other people who are going through hardship and helping them tell their story 
and it's been really moving and it's been a really spiritual experience. These are topics that are really challenging for, for adults and for, for teens, for children to talk about and to be able to um, hear others' stories and to be able to um, share and process different experiences um, and to know that in a way so much of this is a normal part of life and that needs to be taken out of the shadows. So showing segments of Voices of Hope has really helped students really see factual real stories from real Mainers that are relatable, personal, and it makes it okay to talk about mental health issues, substance use disorder, and these issues that are, a lot of our kids are struggling with either themselves or their friends or their families and gives them an idea of how to talk about it, where to get help, and that help is possible and that recovery is possible. Just by its nature, I think it, it creates some feelings in you that make you wonder about these issues and these stories and these people. And just by starting that process, I think it takes you somewhere. Uh, because we all have these experiences in our lives where none of our, us are immune, either to addiction or, or mental illness or any of the kinds of issues that plague us in this culture. I think it gives people an insight and a window into how do we deal with these issues. So David, how did you get uh, the uh, main public, we here in this local area, it's Channel 10, uh, right. to agree that's pretty good. Yeah. One hour in a series for right. several weeks. Well, we, we showed them, we showed them the, the show. Yeah. And uh, it, it wasn't hard to convince them that it was important. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Once yeah. you see this and once you understand uh, right. what's going on in, in our community, uh, well, you want to do something, and I'm sure Maine public wanted to do do something. Let, let me just set uh, the stage a little bit about marijuana in Maine. Um, and let me start by, by telling you that um, the world is also dealing with marijuana. And most countries, you, the people, per capita usage of most countries is less than 10%. Less than 10% of the population uses marijuana. There are a few countries that are very high. Chile is very high, about 38%. Canada. Israel, about 27% of its population uses marijuana. The United States is about 16%. Well, Maine did a survey last year, and they concluded, and I don't know how accurate it is, but they concluded that 41% of the state's adult population is using marijuana. And half of those people are using every day. Now, we know that 90 plus percent of all the marijuana sold in, in, in the state of Maine and around the country is what's considered high potency marijuana. Which what percentage is high potency? Well over 90 percent. It's high potency marijuana. So Does that mean it's more addictive? Yes, more addictive and more psychoactive, uh, more powerful in its impact on, on the brain. Uh, so what has happened in Maine is that we're, we have jumped into it with both feet. Uh, we have a, the sales in, in 2021 were about $775 million, which makes it bigger than the state's lobster business. So you think about the lobster business, which is sold globally. We sell lobsters all over the world. But, but marijuana has to be grown and sold within the state. So in just a few years, we have eclipsed the lobster business with marijuana in Maine. And two-thirds of our kids, because we survey our kids, our, our school kids, two-thirds believe that it's safe to use this very highly potent product once or twice a week. That, that combination of facts in my mind, says that we're going to have a very big problem in the state of Maine for a number of years unless we get the message out to our parents, our grandparents, and our kids. So you, that's the message. Now, you have to deal with 
some variables here. First of all, there will be people watching this show that says, say, look, I use marijuana three times a week, daily, whatever. I'm fine. I'm not addicted. And that might be true. That's right. And for a young person listening to that, do you also have to say, but there are other people for whom it is a disaster? Well, and you don't know right. which of those people that you is are. Absolutely true. But here's another statistic for you. If you if you ask people who have had a substance use disorder, ninety percent of them tell you that they started in their teens. So this is a fact that all addiction businesses understand so well. The undeveloped brain is particularly vulnerable to addiction. And, and we can understand this. I'll use a little metaphor about riding a bicycle. Um, when you're six, you can learn how to ride a bike in about a week or two. And you'll never forget how to ride a bike. I don't know how, when was the last time you rode a bike out there at uh, Kettle Cove? Yeah, well, it's been a while now. You could do it, though. Yeah. You could get on a bike and ride it. You'd never forget. Um, you, we can learn languages when, when we're young. The plasticity of a, of a young brain is, in, is a sponge for learning. It's actually quite hard to develop an addiction if you haven't used the substance in your 20s or teens. Really? Yes. In other words... Your brain it, is already wired... Differently. Your brain is already set up largely for what it wants to engage with. Yeah. yeah the, the, the electrical systems and such and what they react to. Correct. So you're, so so if you start the younger you start, the more likely you are to be addicted. Absolutely. The earlier you start, the more you use, the higher potency you use. Those that's the trifecta. And so Say that again, the trifecta. The the, the earlier you you start, the more times you use and the higher potency you use is the trifecta. And I'm going to say it right out loud, these, the industries understand this better than anybody. That's why we had candy cigarettes, get the kids started early. Uh, that's why it's gummy bears. Because if the that's earlier you cookies. get them started, the better chances that you'll have them for a lifetime. You got it. You got it. And so, so yes, you can have people in their 40s and 50s who are using some marijuana products. Their brains are not affected the same way as a young person. And once a young person's brain becomes attached to liking that substance, it changes their future forever. Uh, certainly addiction is a big part of that, but we know that uh, People who start early, on average, lose eight percentage points, eight points on their IQ. Now, just you know that. Just think about that for a second. You you know, um, IQ is really critical. How do we know that? Th they've studied it. They've studied it all over the world, and they they've they've looked at uh, people longitudinally that have used marijuana and compared it to people who have not. And they have measured their IQ uh, early and late, and just determined that it's been that on average it's been re reduced by eight points uh, because of the effect on the brain. Yes, yes. The um, the uh, the you know I'm not a scientist, but I can read research. Uh, there are many impacts that uh, that it has. Uh, here's a fact that I'm sure nobody knows, but main health. They operate emergency rooms around town. Um, in the last three years, there have been 19,500 uh, events. People came to the emergency ward because they had an adverse effect from using cannabis. Adverse effect to marijuana? Yes. Uh, often, it's uncontrollable vomiting. Often, it is uh, psychosis. They're hearing voices. They're seeing things. They're hallucinating, um, and that so that's 17 per day, uh, and we don't really hear about that. That if I if I were in the newspaper business, I would be singing that you know from uh, from the mountaintops. 
it, it, I find this fascinating. I, I uh, had a good friend in college. I went to Princeton. He then became a psychiatrist. He was Canadian. He went to McGill. He became a very well-known psychiatrist. And he is the best known, he's my age, which is old, uh, 86 in case anybody's interested. But so this guy's my age. He is today uh, the best known person in America for studying the brain. In mm. fact, this is off point, but he got in a lot of trouble with authorities because he was collecting brains. He would, <laughs> people died. Uh, he had a system where he would call them and he'd pay for their loved one's brain. So he and his group of scientists have been studying the brain for a very long time, 50 years. Uh, and he, he has a lot of, uh, of narrative about this, a lot of uh, stuff that he's written ab about the brain and about the effect of these things that we do to ourselves, right. to our brains, right. and how we condition the right. brain by right. th external things that we bring to the brain. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, the, the country has a big addiction problem. Um, and I, and I think it's about 25% about of our adult population uh, is affected directly. And I'll, I'll run to those You're numbers. You're talking about down. alcohol and drugs. About, there's about 260 million people, adults, in the United States. About 26 million people are in recovery, long-term recovery, from some substance. Uh, we also know that about 12.7% of the po adult population are alcoholics. You add on top of this people who have a cannabis use disorder, heroin, cocaine, methamphetamines, you get to 25% of the adult population, one in four. One in four of our adults has somehow compromised their lives and the lives of their families and their friends because they have become attached to a substance and lost a lot of, lot of control. When we interview all the people we've interviewed, I would say that, generally speaking, people, these are all people who are in recovery, usually. They generally have sacrificed about 10 years of their life. And their prime, prime of their life. And they know they've sacrificed they it. They absolutely know it. They, you know, from 17 to 27, 19 to 29, 15 to 30, they have had, they have had those 10 to 15 years of their lives taken away from them because all they could really imagine day in and day out was using a substance. So your program <clears throat> is also about hope. <laughs> and you talk yeah. about, and, and these episodes, which are going to be on main public, right. and hopefully people will watch them, right. first one tomorrow night at 8, Yes. Uh, are about Hope. Yes, voices of hope. Yes. Voices of hope. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> thank you for reminding me about that, Harold, because this is a tough topic. But we end every show on a high because we 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 interview people who have made it, who have come through, uh, I'll, I'll come through hell, and they have they have developed um, their own personal methods, but me methods that can be modeled by others to how to recover from these serious illnesses. Uh, and, you know, the, for a long time, we looked at addiction as a moral failing. Uh, and science knows today that that's not the case. If you look at an MRI... It's physiological. It is absolutely brain changes. You can see an MRI of someone who has a severe addiction, and you can see a damaged brain. What's wonderful about the brain is it heals. If only the person can stay away from the product through whatever methods they use. Um, I'm going to say AA is probably one of the best we've seen. Uh, the AA community here in Portland is very strong. Um, if, they can, if they can hold on for months and years and keep going to meetings and staying with their home group, they can make it. You know, David, uh when I worked in Washington, I worked with a lot of well-known reporters. In the old days, a lot of the 
Washington reporters were known as hard drinking people. Yeah. And, uh, and a lot of politicians, same thing. I knew many in AA in Washington. I knew many. Mm. I was always shocked at the number of people I knew. And, 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 I, and I, one thing I observed, they, they, let, they did it, many of them every day at the beginning, and all of them at least once a week, AA meetings. And mm. I, I, I came to think this, is, this thing works. For, for some, for men, not everybody. Not everybody. Not everybody. Right. But there was a guy, and I'm, he's, he'll go nameless now, but he was well known in Maine. He was a good friend of mine. He's dead now. He was a state senator. He was a big leader in the legislature, well known leader. He was a Portland city councilor. And uh, he went to AA all the time. And he told me when he was a very young man, he started drinking. And he went in the Navy after high school, and he came back and he said he was on the streets of Portland because he said, I was drunk all the time and I couldn't hold a, a job, and I, so I would do it all day long. He said, I slept outside more than I slept in a bed. Yeah. How's that? Yeah. Down and out. Right. And in those days, you'd get arrested for public drunkenness in Portland, they put you in the cell of this police station overnight, let you go in the morning, you start out all, all over again. And um, the police knew him. And uh, one time he was in a bar at 10 o'clock in the morning in Portland, Maine. And the guy said to him in the bar, some guy that he knew, I'm going to call Mr. Welch and have him pick you up. <laughs> Who's Welch? Welch was a lawyer here in town, Vincent Welch. He had a son who was a big time lawyer, incidentally, in Washington, who made a huge amount of money, came back here uh, and did some very nice things for our community, died relatively young. Mr. Welch came in his car to the bar, which was on Outer Congress Street, picked up this guy, brought him to his house, started him in AA. Welch was the f founder, I believe, of AA mm. chapter in Portland. And this guy, it was a young man, telling me this story. He said, and here I am now, 48 years later, I've never touched a drop. I have to go to AA. It is my home. Yeah. It has kept me off the stuff. He's worked two jobs. He had a night job, and then he had this yeah. day job, and then he had the legislature, and kept him busy. And he said, it saved me. I, I'm so glad you told that story. I mean, we, we talked about careers a little bit. I, yeah. I, I've met, I've met a lot of impressive people over the years. I have interviewed probably I don't know, 30 to 50 people in recovery over the last three years. They are by far the most impressive and inspiring group of people I have ever come across. They're what keep me going, because uh, and I've hired these people. And they, they have become, you know, kinship to me because they're so inspiring. I mean, tell one, one other story just to illustrate. A lot of the people uh, watching this show watched, we're talking about public television, uh, Mark Shields. Mark Shields was on television yep. every Friday night on, on the PBS news show. And uh, he's a very close friend of mine. And uh, Shields was an alcoholic. And he was another one who n never touched a drop for 30 years. Wow. Another well-known reporter, columnist in New York, Jimmy Breslin, also a, f a friend of mine, he was an alcoholic. So the two of them used to go out drinking. And then they stopped, they went to AA, and they were re became recovering alcoholics. Yeah. And they were devoted to AA. They didn't see each other because they used to drink together, so they didn't see each sure. other for years. Sure. So one time, uh, so they didn't talk to each other for all those years. They were, their, their social bond right. was gone. Right. And so one time, Breslin, I said to Breslin, you know, I was talking to Shields, and uh, <laughs> he, he wanted me to say hello to you, and the first words out of Breslin's mouth were, does he drink? I said, no. 
I told the story to Shields, and I said, that was his first question. He says, well, let me ask you about yeah. Breslin. Does he drink? I said, no. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, when we think about these particular people, they have lived in hell. They have experienced having no choices in their lives. Uh, he, you know, we, we had, we're going to have over 10,000 overdoses in, uh, in 2022. When the numbers are all in, there'll be, there'll be over 10,000. What do you mean, 10,000 where? Overdoses in, in Maine. In, in this small state? In this small state. Now, about 700 of them will turn out to be fatal. But these people who are experiencing that life, and it's not that much different when you, you can't control your drinking or you can't con control your marijuana, or you, or you don't feel normal if you're not using these substances. When they finally surrender to recovery, then they experience something that I think the normal person doesn't experience. And they really start to love life, and they become very inspiring people. There's, there's something okay, very Okay, so now we've, we've touched on hope and success. Uh, what can we do? What do you do? What, you, you, you're educating well, people, we, and you're educating young people about yeah, this. We're trying to get more and more schools interested in this program. We, uh, but, we, but, why, but even if they're interested, and even if they tell this story, um, does it? W w does well, I'll, I'll give you an example. We have, uh, we have a school teacher who uses our clips in her classroom, and she surveyed the students before she, she used the clips. What percentage of you think it's safe to use marijuana once or twice a week? And the answer was about two-thirds, think it's safe. She does her segment. She shows our clips. She, she is a big uh, advocate of the clips because it brings the stories to life. It brings the science to life. Uh, and then two months later, she asked the same kids, what percentage of you think it's safe to use marijuana once or twice a week? And only 5% say they think it's safe. So we've gone from two-thirds down to 5%. So you're saying that if a young person, a teenager, is educated and understands the science of all of this, that they will be less likely to engage in Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Even with peer pressure? Well, I think, and here's the other thing that people get, learn a little bit. And nobody wants to get played. And when you understand the science a little bit, and then you understand the marketing, then all of a sudden you begin to go, I'm getting played. This product can make me high, but can also hurt me. And they understand that it's all about marketing. It's all about developing a customer, a lifelong customer. And even the bad guys do, uh, who market, the, 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 the criminals who, who market drugs, some very potent drugs, they're in the marketing business. Yeah, and their, that's right. And their whole idea is to get you hooked because they're going to get a lot of cash. You know, and I'm, and I'm not here to tell you it's going to be easy because, you know, we're about in the sixth inning and we're down about six to nothing. Um, and we need a marketing campaign in this state, a messaging campaign for moms, grandmoms, and, and kids in every school um, that that is just as as imaginative and as robust as the marketing campaign that says, use our product, eat our gummy bears, eat our cookies, our popsicles, our drinks. Uh, we need something just that bold to counteract what's out there because we're way behind. On one of the local news programs in the last two or three days, they talked about the number of children, three, four, five-year-old children who have been hospitalized oh, yeah. because of these gummy bears. Right. right. Huge numbers. Sure, they're candy. They're designed to look like candy because they want a young user. Because the younger they are, the more they'll chance yes. they'll be addicted and become a great customer. Absolutely. That's the deal. I mean, if you think, look at, if you look at big marijuana today countrywide, who are the biggest investors? Tobacco, alcohol, pharmaceuticals. So I want to a ask you about fear, because at one point earlier in this interview, you said, uh, you know, you were told 
it, you just can't scare the kids. Right, right. You can't just scare them. But I, I think about what you said. When I was a kid, I would, I, I, we didn't have much marijuana around. I would have been, I, I was fearful. I would have never taken it. Why? For, afraid. Yeah, me too. Afraid. Yeah. But um, so fear, I mean, you, you got to be a little bit afraid of this. Well, I think you have to be knowledgeable. Um, and I think that, I don't think we do a very good job um, in our culture raising kids to be kids. It seems like we're always trying to push them along. That, that five-year-olds, we want them to be eight. And eight-year-olds, we want them to be 12. And 12-year-olds, we want them to be 18. And that teaching kids to just love, love being kids, and playing, like all the ball fields or whatever, playing a piano, is so much more important than always marketing to these kids so that they always want to be older, always want to be older. Um, I think that's, that's also so, sort of a cultural um, but, but dysfunction that we have. I, I uh, sometimes in the summer when I pass through uh, the park during Oaks and you see all the people out there and you do see people with needles yeah. You see, and you see people sprawled out, yeah. unconscious, right. and so forth. Right. Um, I say to myself, well, if some kid is in a car and goes by and sees this, he doesn't want to be one in, in this situation. So, doesn't the kid get scared? Don't you know? We read about people dying from overdoses. Who? Nobody wants to die. So. Don't they say, oh, no, I'm not going to touch that stuff because I never want to be in a situation where I might die from it. Maybe if they think about it. But, you know, when we see things, and I'm sure your, your friend, the, the scientist, would yeah. tell you, it becomes normal. We get desensitized to it. Go back five years. We did not see the number of people standing on street corners begging like we do today. Right. Deering Oaks five to ten years ago didn't look like Deering Oaks looks today. No, it didn't. But it's almost become normal almost acceptable, and that's a big danger for us. And it's not going to get better if, if we are this, um, if we are this loose with our marijuana policies, because hard drugs lead to other hard drugs. And th so, you know, we know that we've got a big opioid problem in the state of Maine, and the state's doing a lot at, at trying to, to curb it. How do they curb it? Well, they, they, have, they have more recovery uh, operations going yeah. on without, r around the state. Places where you can get treatment. Where you can get treatment. Um, but the numbers go up every year. So uh, it's, we're, not, we're not gaining on that problem. And, and in my estimation, the reason we're not gaining on that problem is because it's marijuana is the minor leagues. It's where we start. Now, that doesn't mean every kid who, who uses marijuana is going to end up using opiates, but a percentage of them will, without a yeah. doubt. That's a feeder system for the next, uh, for the next generation of, of opioid yeah. abusers. Yeah. So, yeah, it depends on their wiring. Yes. And so you don't know how you're wired. I mean, I, if I were 16 years old, I have no idea how I'm wired. I might be wired where I could uh, take these uh, uh, drugs and not become uh, addicted for the rest of my life. Yep, that's true. Or I might be wired where I would become, and I don't know. Genetics plays a role. Yeah, uh, genetics plays a role. Genetics plays a role. About, uh, in about half the cases, there's, there's a genetic predisposition to a particular addiction. Both drugs and alcohol? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 would, uh, I, I, I can understand the genetics, particularly with alcohol. You see it, families right. suffering right. from it. Sure, sure. Going back about five generations in my family, uh, my estimate is about half of the adults uh, were alcoholics, and about half of them uh, were successful in recovery. That's interesting. About half, and about half of them was successful in recovery. And so do you think that 
your son, probably some some genetic basis to his addiction? I have no doubt about it. No doubt about no it. No question about it. And he doesn't have any question about it either. Uh, and yet, and we, we, we eliminated any alcohol in our home as soon as we had kids. Um, and we, we, we taught them that we could have a lot of fun without mm -hmm. alcohol. Um, and uh, yeah, one of my sons, uh, he took to it. Uh, one of the interesting things when you watch our show, a, a number of people will say this about how when they got started, um, the first time I used our alcohol, the first time I used marijuana, I liked it. I really liked it. Red flag. Because you've met people who said, yeah, I could take it or leave it. That person's not going to have a problem. Ah, I see. You, 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 yeah, you're saying something that I understand so well because I had peer pressure growing up, and I, you know, they, they have a beer, or they're having a beer, have a beer. But I never liked it. The, uh, I have a drink, I have a gin and tonic uh, from time to time, not very often, but I do. I'm sociable with it, but I don't like it. But I know people that really like it. Need it. That's what you're saying, that's different? That's different, yeah, need it and like it. Let me give you another statistic, we're probably running out of time, but the, well, the alcohol business is, is based on this addiction as well. Uh, they did a study about 20 years ago, and I think it's held up. Uh, they looked at how much do people drink. Well, really, about two-thirds of the adult population either doesn't drink or drinks very little, mm -hmm. like how you describe it. Yeah. 10% of the adult population drinks about 74% of all the alcohol that's sold in the United States. So some people like it and some people are well, not crazy about it. What it means it. is that people who have become attached to the product, they fuel the business. And everybody in the addiction business understands this. Colorado looked at marijuana, 4% of all the users in Colorado buy 65% of all the marijuana sold in Colorado. The people that are in that business understand that. They know that we need users who will use every day, and that means we need people who are addicted to our product. And the best way to get people addicted to our product is start them early, have them use regularly, and have them use a high potency. That's the trifecta. The trifecta. You know, I looked at uh, uh, a little bit of the episode you're going to show tomorrow night. And uh, one young lady said, you know, when I was, I don't know, 15, 14, uh, my friend said, try this. You'll like it. I like it. And she said, and I liked it. <laughs> yeah, and I, I liked it. I know who you're talking and, about. And then she said, uh, but, you know, I had limits. First of all, the very thought of putting something up my nose would just uh, she yeah. creep her out. Creep her out. Cringe. And no one, the needle, ooh. And then it had a guy on, a young man. He said, needle. I wouldn't, the very thought of it. And the point that, that they made was, they set limits. I would never do this. And guess what? Every limit that they set or what they wouldn't do because of the addiction. Yeah. Because yeah. of the addiction, they broke that limit and they did it all, including well, needles. Brittany describes it very well where she says, I have a brain. Even after all these things I've done, terrible things I've done, stolen from my grandmother on her deathbed, I have a brain that tells me it's okay. Just one more time. You can handle it now. And when our brain actually uh, turns on us and convinces us that, that uh, the addiction is in control, then that's when people lose total control of, of their lives. And that's how they go to needles. That's how they have multiple overdoses. And that's how they can't stop, no matter how many times they're, they're their family and their friends ask them, and how many promises they make. They have to get into a serious recovery program, and I think AA is probably the best one I've heard of. So there's a book written by a man I know, 
named Cope Moyers, William Cope Moyers. His father, Bill Moyers, was my boss in Washington. Mm. Father was a very famous journalist. Oh, I remember. Bill Moyers. Yeah. Cope was brought up, his father was the publisher of Newsday, then he was CBS uh, television news guy and uh, famous. And uh, Cope was brought up with all the advantages and he became a drug addict starting in high school. Wow. And seriously addicted. His parents went through a horrible time with him. Uh, in the book, he describes how his mother, and his mother has told me this story herself, how she and a lawyer friend of hers who was helping them uh, went in Harlem to a crack house. Yeah. And there's people, he had nothing in common with the people other than it was a place to get high. And took him out of there. And then he relapsed, they got him, he, he went to work for CNN as a r reporter in Atlanta as, for CNN and was doing very well, relapsed, was in a crack house down there. Mm. And his father, with some people that he'd hired, found him and brought him out of the crack house. And he tells us, Cope Moyers tells the story of sitting in the car with his father after he got him out of the crack house. And he said to his father, who loved him dearly, that's why he was going through all of this, to save him, said, you probably hate me. And he said, my father paused mm. because he was so upset mm. and so angry. Yeah. Um, so Cope Moyers, struggled in and out of treatment. And then he went to Hazleton in yep. Minnesota and St. Paul. Yep. And he has been clean for wow. 25 years. Wow. And he is actually a senior vice president of Hazleton in charge of no external kidding. relations. He came to Portland to speak one time on drug addiction. And um, I've got to put you in touch with Cope I'd love to speak in, with in your program. Yeah. But so I guess the point there is mm. it can happen to anyone, sure to can. any one of us. Sure can. All the people that are out here who have children, grandchildren, sisters, brothers, uh, they know it can happen to them and in their family. I know it can happen to me and in my family. So it's important for all of us to learn a lot about us and all of us to be on the alert. And right, right. Well, we've got to get bold. We've got to be. We've got to be as bold as they are. And what does being bold mean to you? We 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 have got to. We've got to increase the amount of education in our schools. We've got to use. Don't, they don't necessarily have to use our programming, but they they've got to use better programming. You know, we still have a lot in rural Maine. We still have a lot of, you know, good uh, lacrosse coaches that teach health. Well, then they're not qualified for that. Uh, we need people uh, that have the qualifications to teach the science uh, and do so in a manner that is interesting and engages young people. Our project is to engage young people. We, we do not preach to these young people about, about uh, drugs and alcohol, ever. Mm -hmm. But we put them behind a the camera. We let them do transcriptions. We let them do interviews. Uh, we let them do animation. And they, they, you, you're saying the kids that you're working with right. actually run the cameras? We give them projects. Uh, we give them as many projects as, as we, they can handle. And what happens is they, they meet the people. And all of a sudden, they think, wow, this is really something. Never once have we ever said to a kid, you, know, you shouldn't be using marijuana. But they learn from the people they meet. So how do you find the kids that tell their stories about their own addiction? Yeah, um, it's, it's, been, it's been unbelievable. They I can come, tell you, move, I asked that question and you're moved. They, they come out of the woodwork, Harold. You know, it's somebody tells their story and then somebody hears that they told their story. I want to tell my story. Um, we've got more people than we need and they are, they are, um, they're unabashed. Well, how do you, but how do you connect? They call your office, they hear about it, and they call you up in your well, office? I work with a, I work with the Portland Recovery Center. 
okay. uh, on my board. I've got people who are in recovery. I hire people who are in recovery. The people in recovery are crucial to this education program. Uh, we need to have them into some of these schools being able to answer questions of young people. We have a lot of, a lot of young people. I, I hear from principals who say, uh, every month a family comes to me and they've got a real problem with this and I don't know what to say to them. Well, one of our projects is to take a, a team of six or eight of these very well vetted uh, people who are in recovery, young, in their 20s, who can go into these schools and talk to these kids and help them. So the name of the program is SEEDS. Students Empowered to End Dependency. And if somebody is interested, that's watching, is interested, there's two or three things they can do. One, watch this series beginning tomorrow night on Maine PBS. Right. Uh, but suppose they wanted to con suppose they had somebody who, who a, a person, a member of their family who was suffering from addiction, and they wanted to talk to you or somebody that you oh, work yeah. with. How would they do that? Sure, on the website they can contact us. Okay, uh, so the website is take this down, everyone. Give them the website. Voicesofhopeandrecovery.org. Voices of Hope and Recovery all run together. Yes. Dot org. Dot org. And you can, you can leave us a, 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 an email. Uh, there's other ways you can contact us right off the, right off, uh, off the website. Uh, okay. And can they, can, can they uh, access online some of these episodes? Uh, yeah. Watch all the episodes online. The first six ep episodes are all there. We're working on the the, the next six episodes. They'll and I love what you did with the name of the first episode is? Uh, in the beginning, I liked it. <laughs> in the beginning, I liked the it. The second episode is The Slippery Slope. All right. Well, listen, uh, I'm so glad that uh, you contacted me. I'm so glad we had you on. And I will be following uh, uh, the work of SEEDS and looking at these programs you're doing on Maine Public. I wish you well. It's, I can't think of more important work Thank than you. the work you're doing. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. coming, David. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Delighted to be here.